All right, good morning, quantum enthusiasts. Uh, I'm really happy about today, because um, we're going to do this. We're going to sort of really start beginning like quantum programming today. OK, so you know, in lecture one, I kind of told you, um, I kind of was trying to disappoint you by saying, like, look, there's only so many, there's like only a few really, truly interesting quantum algorithms for classical problems. And so if you came in here thinking, like, I want to learn, like, all the different programming paradigms in quantum, I'm like, well, there's two, maybe, one or two, arguably. Um, well, I'll tell you one of them right now. Like, to the extent that there are, like, programming paradigms in, in quantum, uh, I'll tell you one right now. And it's exactly the one that's, like, used here. And... It's sort of, uh, well, it's sort of called using the, the Hadamard transform or the Fourier transform. So, you know, I might call this paradigm uh, kind of uh, computing and superposition but, and uh, the Hadamard transform. And the Hadamard transform is a kind of Fourier transform. And, um, you know, you've probably heard of Fourier transforms in your life, and they're supposed to be, like, good for something. They're supposed to, like, take a bunch of data, transform it in such a way that, like, you learn some, like, important signals that are in the data. And that's actually what somehow went on here. Like, this first four steps got some data about mystery toggles into the amplitudes. And this kind of did a Fourier transform, which revealed the important frequencies or patterns in the data, which in this case was like this one. That's a very, it's like too high level, you can't get it, but like that's the, that's somehow the highest level idea of what happened here. So let me try to describe this paradigm at a high level. It probably will only make 40% sense, but we'll flesh it out in the next two weeks, okay? So here's my attempt to describe this paradigm. Um, okay. Suppose uh, you have some classical code that you care about and you want to like understand something about it. So suppose, I'm just gonna use this notation, C code, that just stands for like a block of classical code, a computer program that you might write. I don't know, it's in Python or something. Okay, is a classical computer program. Uh, Let's say taking in n bits. It's a classical program, so it takes in bits, of course, and outputting, uh, I don't know, some bits. I'll say m bits. Okay, it's a code, it's like some function that, you know, has an input and has some return values, and, you know, we code everything in bits in, in computer science, so it's input and output bits. And, like, somehow you're supposed to imagine that, like, there's some mystery aspect to this code or, like, what this code does that you're hoping to reveal. Now, you might say, like, how could there be a mystery? Like, I wrote the code. There's no mystery to it. But, you know, you can write some code but, like, not really be sure what it does, right? Like, it's possible to write code and then be like, I don't really know what this code does. So maybe you still have some mystery about this code that you wish to learn. Um, okay. In this example, the, this mystery code is going to be mystery toggles. Uh, but I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so here's the, the long paradigm, which is like multiple steps. Uh, okay, so step one. So it's, it's going to be about like trying to learn something about your code using the power of quantum computation. So um, step one is to like convert your classical code to quantum code. That's somehow equivalent. So again, we'll have to think about what this means, but like equivalent and equivalent quantum program, which I'll call, I don't know, a uh, Q code. Okay, this will be like a list of, you know, if then toggles and Hadamard and, you know, clockwise and other such instructions uh, on n qubits. Okay, so quantum code operates on qubits, so somehow you convert your classical code into equivalent 
quantum code, but like quantum code that works on qubits rather than bits. And the cool thing about doing that is like once you have code that somehow does quantum code that does something, but on qubits, then you can like instead of just putting in zeros and ones, you can put in a superposition of bit strings. So you're like, oh, now I could try to use the power of quantum. So that's what you do. Um, so you now write a quantum program that does this. You prepare the so-called uniform superposition. Which just means uh, amplitude 1 on every single basic state. Amplitude 1 on all 2 to the n basic states. OK, so you're kind of going to get ready to use this quantum code, which operates on n qubits. But first, you're like, OK, I'm going to like, you know, new those n qubits. And then I'm going to do a few instructions so that um, my starting, or I get to the state where I have amplitude 1 on all the 2 to the n possibilities. Um, this is an unnormalized state. Uh, so maybe it should be square root of 1 over 2 to the n normalized. But let's say amplitude 1 on all the 2 to the n basic states. And it turns out this is really easy. You can do this with like n quantum instructions. Uh, so OK. So now you kind of have like equal amplitude on all possible inputs to the code. You have equal amplitude on all possible inputs to the code. Then you're like, OK, this is pretty cool. Like I'll just run the quantum code. Run you know, Q code. And then in some sense, you get um, all possible 2 to the n input output pairs. Well, somehow encoded in the amplitudes. Okay, again, we're going to flesh this out like over the next two weeks, but you know somehow this is like the cool part. Maybe like oh, you got your quantum computer to like run on all possible inputs simultaneously. Which sounds awesome. Um, now, there's another step here where like you want to like you don't just want to have all the input output pairs, like you want to kind of get the right answers, like you want to get the right output pairs for like a given input. So somehow you got to do some more quantum stuff. In particular, this more quantum stuff has to kind of like use this cancellation, this like key power of quantum. It's got to like cancel out the wrong answers and keep alive the right answers. And one thing that's funny is like you can't cancel out the, you can't cancel out anything unless you have positives and negatives. So this is this will maybe be the, the the aspect of the paradigm that makes the least amount of sense to you right now. But like somehow you have to get negative signs involved, get like negative amplitudes involved. Because, well, yeah, as I said, some of the key step is going to be like getting positives to cancel with negatives. Okay, and then like here's maybe the final part. Uh, well, the most important part, I'll put it in red, because it corresponds to this. You just do Hadamard at all. And this is kind of the Fourier transform part. Like somehow here, the amplitudes encode, the actual numerical values of the amplitudes like encode some information about all possible input-output pairs for this function. And this, as we'll see, kind of so that's like two to the n data points or something, and like this instruction, kind of does the Fourier transform to that data, and this Fourier transform, I don't know, mixes and matches and cancels stuff out, and thereby maybe gets a lot of amplitude onto like important signals in the data and like very little amplitude on the unimportant signals in the data. So somehow, this does something really cool. <laughs> And then uh, well, last step is basically just profit, you know. Uh, hopefully, so you just that's it. Extract all, and maybe profit. So hopefully, now you have like all the amplitude on like the most important solution to the mystery about classical code 
and then this will hopefully just print it out. So this is the plan. It's kind of like a rickety plan, and so maybe it's like not so surprising that like, yeah, that's the plan, but like we've implemented it like for a couple problems. So one thing I want to do is tell you how this was actually an exemplar of this precise plan. OK, so how is Toggle's detective like fitting into this plan? So OK, the first thing is like, you imagined you were in a situation where you had some like classical code that did something, but somehow it was a mystery to you, and you want to like learn something about it. Here, it's kind of like the classical code was uh, the mystery toggles function. Now, there's a couple of things slightly wrong about that. First of all, the mystery toggles code that you know, was here, that was actually quantum code. Uh, but it was quantum code that happened to only use classical reversible instructions, right? It only contained like if then toggle. And therefore, it's also classical code that could uh, be run on bits. So like you should instead like imagine that like you know mystery toggle started out life as like classical code. And then uh, step one was real easy because you're like, oh, luckily this classical code like already only uses classical reversible instructions, and therefore I don't have to do anything in step one. Like it's kind of already like quantum code that could be run on qubits. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that because I, I did like omit that for like a reason because. Normally, here I'm thinking about like these are you should think of this like code that just like manipulates bits, okay? And um, it's perfectly normal to have like a you know a subroutine that like takes in n bits and manipulates them and returns m bits. But that's like literally impossible quantumly because with manipulation instructions only, like you don't new any new qubits or extract anything, and like everything you do is like these path diagrams has a path diagram or matrix with the same number of inputs and outputs. So like you can't even have quantum code where like the number of like qubit manipulation code where the number of inputs and output bits is different. So that's why like for example this is like not trivial. We have to talk a lot about like what does this even mean. Uh, so that's why I was a little bit not writing like what does it what does it mean here. Now luckily in this specific example like uh, with mystery toggles this classical code it like takes in n qubits. It was like six in the scratch demo or seven I guess in the scratch demo. And it was like three in today's uh, version. And it manipulates them and just returns them back to you. That's how you should think of it. So like, there's like three input bits and three output bits. So uh, we'll see that like, in general, like maybe uh, Q code might eventually have like, might operate on like n plus m qubits, potentially. Because like it's got to somehow be doing this, even though quantum code cannot, you know, change the number of qubits. So that's why it's like it's some equivalent version. We're gonna have to talk about it. Actually, yeah. So this uh, maybe this is like I should put n prime qubits here just to be careful. But let me not. Uh, okay. Anyway, this is just a paradigm. Let's not worry about it. But it's a good question though. Okay. So. Yeah, in this like funny case of mystery toggles, like these are all the same thing because luckily the the code that we are trying to learn the mystery of happens to already use uh, classical reversible instructions. Um, good. Moreover, like this was really like by the way, this is the, really a very toy example. It's like almost it's like designed just to be like a toy that illustrates this um, and. The fact that like there's something mysterious about this code, like I had to like just impose by fiat to you. I just had to be like pretend that even though we have this code, like pretend you don't know what this code is. Like pretend there's a mystery to it, and you're like that's dumb. I can just look at the code. I, there's no mystery. But I'm just like just pretend there's a mystery because later when we get this to use this in more sophisticated situations, you'll have the code. Yet you won't. There'll be some aspect to it that like you don't know. Like it'd be like here's the code. What's an input that causes this code to output all zeros? That's a very hard question. Like you have the code, 
it could be very hard to try to find the answer of like what's an input that makes an output all zeros. Like that's the kind of example of like a potential mystery you could try to maybe solve. But in this mystery toggle thing, it's like a dumb mystery of just like what is the code. But we need a simple example. Okay, so uh, that's kind of that for mystery toggles. And what about this? Prepare the uniform superposition. Um, that's basically exactly this. Uh, as it's not very hard to show, and we'll see it pretty soon, that um, if you start a bunch of qubits at all zeros, which is the typical way you start, and then you do Hadamard all to them, or add and diff all, you get to this state. It's not very hard. You could check it yourself, actually, while I'm talking. Um, but we'll do it later. So that's why I said, like, this is actually a very easy step, and uh, it only takes an instruction. So, like, you know, if your code has a thousand bits that it works on, uh, it's no problem. A thousand instructions to get this state is no problem. Even though they're two to the one thousand basic states, which is like more than, you know, the number of particles in the universe or whatever. Um, good. So that's basically this. Now, there's something a little bit funky because I told you if you have all the qubits are zero and then you do Hadamard all, you get to the, the uniform superposition. That's not quite what we did though. We toggled answer first. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit, that's, that's the reason for, I mean, the reason we toggled answer is like somehow connected to this. Somehow, uh, you know, we don't have any negative signs here, and so it's gonna like, we're gonna have like a bad time if our plan is to get things to like cancel out. And somehow throwing this one thing in here, a toggle answer, which makes it one, you know, once you have like one, you do Hadamard on one, like that's the case where you can get like some negative amplitudes. If you only do Hadamard on zero, you get like amplitudes root a half and root a half. But when you do it on one, you get root a half and minus root a half. So somehow this is like designed to like just get some negatives into the picture. I know this is like kind of wonky, but like we'll get some explanation of this, more explanation of this as we go along. Uh, in the most typical case, um, we'll sort of take Q code, which does the compute, computing, like uh, some version of computing C code, and we'll like glue a little thing onto Q code, which has it create negative signs. And so like by gluing this little bit onto Q code that like makes negative signs, like that's where this will like kind of come in. And uh, yeah, in some extremely weird way, like the little gluing it in is like, this, like that's the glue into our Q code that creates negative signs. But this is maybe more detail than I, you know, want you to think about at this moment. Okay, so basically you do all these like Hadamard instructions for the purpose of getting the uniform superposition where you have a uniform amount one on all the possibilities. Okay, then you run Q code, and that's, that's simply this. That's step four. Uh, that's it. So good. And as I said, the somehow getting negative signs in there is like weirdly taken care of by like this piece, so let's not worry about it more than that. And then five is five. It exactly matches up, which is an accident. Five is five. So here's like where the magic kind of happens. Well, the Hadamard all kind of is, uh, takes place. And remember, we kind of did that today, and like, somehow, before we did this, like, we had all, like, amplitudes of plus or minus one, and like, the pattern of where plus ones and minus ones were was kind of dictated by mystery toggles, in a sense. Like, if we had a different mystery toggles, we'd have pluses and minuses in different places on our cube diagram. And then, Hadamard all, in this particular case, has the effect that, like, it kind of collapses them all together, uh, and puts like all the amplitude on just one correct answer. It's like somehow it's set up so that like this, this Fourier transform like figures out like the important patterns in the data. In this case, there's like one important pattern, the one associated with, I don't know, one and zero. You're still probably like, what? But, uh, that's the best I can say right now, I think. <laughs> I'm a rock. I'm a rock. I'm a rock.